We have we have liftoff. Liftoff at 7:51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the top. Tower clear. 13 seconds. Today, we're in the San Diego Aerospace Museum in beautiful and historic Balboa Park in San Diego, California. And we are honored to have with us astronaut Wally Shira, one of the original seven astronauts. Welcome to Aviation Theater. Thank you, Fred. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, NASA and uh, our space program. And uh, first off, uh, Kennedy, President Kennedy, did not uh, create NASA. It was President Eisenhower. A lot of people give Kennedy, President Kennedy, of course, mm -hmm. credit for it. Now, we actually were brought into an organization that was formed by President Eisenhower, he was president when we were brought into the space program. Now that was 1956, 57? Uh, he formed NASA in 58. 58. We joined it in April of 59. And the reason you joined was that they scoured the United States. They went through the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, civilian pilots, and they chose approximately 200 that was the cream of the crop. I guess that was, well, we came out of a computer anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure whether the cream was there or not. <laughs> and uh, you were one of those 200 pilots. Yes, yes. And then after extensive uh, testing uh, of all sorts uh, that went beyond anything that had ever been done before. <laughs> I admit to that. <laughs> uh, they chose out of the 200 best, they chose seven that were the best of the best, and you were one of America's original seven Mercury astronauts. That was a small family, it really was. We, uh, we were probed by all the doctors that they could find, including psychologists. Uh, they, as John Glenn said at our first press conference in April of 59, they probed every hole they could find. <laughs> uh, he said something like, uh, it's surprising how many there are and how far in they can go. Yes, very good. <laughs> uh, after NASA was established, uh, the first astronaut to go up uh, was uh, Alan Shepard. Uh, you were all waiting to see who would be chosen first. We all thought we were one of the very best. Uh, well, that was part of the requirement, sure. that you had to think you were the best. Well, every fighter pilot thinks he is the very best. Anybody else is second, third, or fourth. That, that's a requirement. <laughs> sure. Uh, but when they announced the first pilot, they didn't announce the first one. They announced the first three. Yeah, very good. That was uh, Shepard, Grissom, and Glenn. And so uh, the other four of us felt rather badly about that. Uh, it could, could have been a roll of the dice or something because I, I remember at the time they said uh, one of the reasons they chose Shepard was that uh, they thought that he might possibly have more in reserve, hmm. uh, which uh, who knows, you know, it's just on that day maybe he raised his eyebrow better than you did or something like well, that. Well, was another thing we took, which is a test that people don't talk about too often. It's called peer rating, where the six judge which one of the seven is the best other than themselves. Oh. So we, uh, I think most of us voted for Al Shepard. Well, I was, that's interesting. And that was what we call a peer rating. So from that, Shepard was chosen as number one. So he went up, he made a suborbital flight, yeah. which is straight up and then right back down again. Like a big cannon shot. Mm -hmm. That was, what, 15, 20 minutes? It was a very about short 15 flight. 15 minutes, mm -hmm. probably, uh, oh, I'd say maybe five minutes weightless, because you're under boost going up. And yes. You're under deceleration mm -hmm. coming down. Uh, I'll never forget Alan, though, he said, lift off, the clock has started. And from then on, we always said, lift off, the clock has started. <laughs> the, uh, the second one up was Gus Grissom, and he also made a suborbital flight, which was up and back down again. Essentially a mirror image of what Shepard did. Same thing that he did. Uh, he experienced a problem, though, uh, with the, his, was it the hatch that blew? Well, the hatch somehow blew off, and it wasn't due to Gus doing it. I made mm -hmm. that clear. I, I believe but, that. Uh, I believe that. And uh, the result, though, the, uh, we'd like to call it the spacecraft. It was called a capsule in those days, but mm -hmm. like this thing back here. But the, uh, the point is that when the hatch came off, uh, the water line is right near the edge of the hatch. Yes. And the spacecraft sank. He climbed out and 
that the spacecraft was hooked up to a helicopter, and the helicopter had a problem and had to let loose of the spacecraft. So it's at the bottom of the ocean about like, two or three. Did, did I say capsule? Did I say? Oh, it's a... perfectly hard to say. Oh capsule. well, I, <laughs> uh, it was not a capsule. It was a spacecraft, and you were not occupants. You were pilots. Very good. Uh, I, I remember those two words. Well, you know the funny thing. We, we, we all argue about being spacecraft pilots or commanders. The person who talks to the crew in space, even today with shuttle, is called the capsule communicator. Oh, is that, that right? That name is hung in there. It, it stuck time. for some yeah. reason. Huh? So don't, you don't have to apologize for calling it capsule. <laughs> okay, the third one up was uh, John Glenn, mm -hmm. and uh, he was the first one to orbit, and uh, up until that time, you didn't have a rocket that was strong enough uh, to orbit. That's why you made one of the reasons you made suborbital flights. Yeah, with the Redstone. We used the Atlas, of course, on John Glenn, Scott's mine, and Gordon Cooper's flight. But at the time that you and John Glenn and Gordon Cooper flew on the Atlas, it still wasn't 100% uh, safe. They were, they were still having problems with it. Well, we had we had two versions of the Atlas. We had what we used. We called it man-rated. Of course, they're made here in San Diego at General Dynamics in those days, and we uh, had XX test performed on that particular Atlas, as contrasted to the military Atlas that was used for nuclear weapons, and they blew up with great regularity. They grounded all the military Atlases before my flight and that they had, had so many blow up that they said, okay, sure, we're going to ground them. I said, well, what difference is there? Well, yours is man-rated. Made, made me feel a little bit better. <laughs> so uh, they used the Atlas. Uh, John Glenn went up, and he orbited three orbits, three, was it? About four and a half hours. And uh, they thought that his heat shield was loose. A red light came on. Yes. And uh, tell our viewers what would have happened had the heat shield been loose. Well, it's interesting because in back of us is the heat shield and the retro rocket, and that strap you see that holds the retro rocket, the black and white yes. package to the rest, mm -hmm. those straps also hold the heat shield against the base of the spacecraft. Incidentally. Incidentally. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get done with the retro rocket to slow down to re-enter, you jettison the retro rocket, then those straps are gone. So the decision was made in that we thought the heat shield was loose to keep the retro rocket package on there, which would hold the heat Which was on. not its purpose at all, all no. but, but which it served for. It, did uh -huh. work, it worked out. Apparently, as we look back on it, there was a micro switch, a little tiny switch that sensed motion. It was slightly out of adjustment, and it gave the indication that the heat shield was loose, when in fact it was not. You had mentioned that um, uh, you were flying in a, in a spacecraft uh, that was built by the lowest bidder. <laughs> <laughs> one of the remarks, uh, one of the dear friends I have, Walter Cronkite, said, uh, I understand when Wally was on his back uh, on that Mercury flight, he was looking up at the space saying, hmm, just think this is all put together by the lowest bidder. <laughs> this is a typical Cronkite talk. <laughs> um, I, I forgot to mention something. In Gus Grissom's flight, they added a parachute. Mm -hmm. uh, that you couldn't get into no. <laughs> if you had to. No. But Gus said that it would give you something to do until you hit. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. That's typical Gus Grissom, you're right. Uh, after John Glenn orbited three times, Deke Slayton was to be next, mm -hmm. he was to be fourth. But tell our viewers what happened. Well, unfortunately, uh, in fact, we're out here in San Diego visiting the General Dynamics plant, and six of us came, Deke Slayton didn't come. And we all wondered why, and we found out later, this was some time later, that he had a heart fibrillation where the heart doesn't pump accurately on a time schedule. It varies once in a while. That's a simple way of saying it, at least. But the result of it was that uh, he was grounded. So with deep grounded, I thought, ha-ha-ha. You were his backup. I was going to have the mm -hmm. flight. And I came to uh, Langley after a, a flight I flew in, and Scott Carpenter had a party at his home, and my wife was there, and we all rendezvoused. And Scott said, I've got some bad news. What happened? Well, Deke's grounded. Right away, my mind. That's uh, not bad news. No, I, got, I got a good <laughs> flight. And you know, Scott said, no, you don't have the flight. I have it. The, the decision was made that the flight that Scott would make would be the mirror image of John Glenn's flight, much like Gus was the mirror image of, of uh, mm -hmm. Al Shepard. Another three-orbit yeah. flight. Uh -huh. Then as time went on, I said, well, that's a lousy deal. So then I ended up being Scott's backup. And then, I, of course, I had the next flight. And I had the better flight because I had six orbits instead of a copy of what John Glenn's was. Well, now, when Scott made that flight, 
Uh, did he do three orbits? He only had three orbits, and he, he got intrigued by John Glenn's fireflies, <laughs> and he started knocking the side of the spacecraft and seeing these little things drifting around, which of course were condensed water. Actually, it was molecular water that froze into one crystal, and they drifted around randomly like fireflies. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, Scott became unaware of the time that he should fire his retros, which would make a precise reentry, and held off too long. Now, in addition, he had flown it around too much with his attitude control stick and almost ran out of attitude control fuel. So by the time he landed, he was 250 miles away from where he should have landed. Well, now, he was um, approximately three seconds late yep. in firing his retro rockets. And that's what adds up to that 250 but, miles. But uh, when you're traveling at 1,000 miles an hour... About 20,000 miles an hour. 20,000 miles an hour, uh, three seconds uh, well, that takes is a lot. Road, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, he missed the target, uh, the landing spot, to a couple hundred miles. Yes, that was too, was too bad. Of course, he got there, and uh, there were some problems with mission control telling the world that we didn't know where he was. Oh. And as a result, everybody thought we lost him, when in fact he was being tracked in electronically. And an airplane flew over, saw him, they dropped some uh, what we call SEALs today, underwater demolition mm -hmm. team people, and they managed to get Scott all squared away and brought him back. Uh, Wally, you're on the board of directors, aren't you, for yes, the museum? Yes, I am. I've been active uh, since I moved out here in 84, came here from Denver. What's interesting, uh, then the uh, president of the board was Chick Smith, Armistead Burwell Smith. He was my very first squadron skipper in my naval aviation days. My tie, of course, proves that point, but uh, I flew F-8F Bearcats at Quonset Point. Chick Smith was my skipper. When I came here, he said, Shira, you're going to work for me again. So I came on the board. Wildcat, Hellcat, Bearcat, is this, that right? This is the Bearcat, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, let's get on then with uh, your flight. Mm -hmm. uh, you were next up to bat, and uh, tell us about your flight in the Mercury program. Well, I named the spacecraft, here I go, spacecraft again. I named the spacecraft Sigma 7, and the symbol Sigma would be like a wide open E. Mm -hmm. A Greek E. A Greek E, exactly. Mm -hmm. But it stands for, the symbol sigma stands for the sum of the engineering effort of all these people to make the flight go the way it should go, perfectly. And I named it Sigma 7. Now the 7 comes from the 7 of us. We named all of our spacecraft something, 7, Freedom, Faith, mm -hmm. Aurora, Sigma 7. And that's why we, uh, we honored each other, because we all worked together so closely. The flight, I wanted to work perfectly. I wanted to save attitude control fuel. When the spacecraft pilots have to use their hands. Mm -hmm. Spacecraft rolls or pitches or yaws, but a controller would do it this way and go psh, and it would go like that, and then you'd go psh, to stop it because you just keep on going around. So each time you did that, you you used up attitude control fuel. They could do psh, psh, which would waste a lot too of fuel. Much. Too mm -hmm. much. Too much. And that's what happened to Glenn and Carpenter. They used too much fuel. So I made very tiny motions. And as a result, I had 80% of my attitude control fuel by the time I ended the mission. Well, I want to say to our viewers that um, you flew an absolutely perfect, no mistakes, no errors, textbook flight and came down in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> True. <laughs> so uh, you, you didn't run out of fuel or uh, make any mistakes. You flew an absolutely perfect mission. Uh, but when you came down, the front page was full of the Cuban Missile yes. Crisis. You know, oddly enough, uh, we went to Washington to President Kennedy's Oval Office. Sitting in there, with my wife, my son, and my daughter. My daughter was five. She held her little hand up like I'm five to then President Kennedy rocking in his chair. That very day, he was wondering whether the missile crisis would come to an end or not. That very day. So I'm in the history books, at least, for being with the president on that day. <laughs> then uh, the next, and as it turned out, the last uh, Mercury flight was Gardo. Cooper. Gardo Cooper. Uh, what happened two days before he made his flight? <laughs> <laughs> He'd like to forget that too, but we, we're all hotshot fighter pilots, and that's part of what we started out saying. And Gordo decided he was flying an F-106, which is a Mach 2 fighter, and decided to buzz the Cape, which means fly over the low. He buzzed quite low and went right over the administration building, and Walt Williams was our senior NASA guy there from NASA itself, as was Deke Slayton and Al Shepard were there. And Deke Slayton, by this point in time, was in charge of the astronaut office and said, I should ground that guy and give the flight to Shepard, but 
I'm going to let him have it. And Walt Williams said, okay, you're in charge, Deke. That's the deal. So when uh, Cooper made his flight, uh, he had a complete systems failure. Everything shut down. Would well, you tell our viewers about that? This flight, uh, this flight was called uh, Faith 7. Uh, Gordon took off as I did normally, no problems, and he flew his mission quite well. But it was to be a 24-hour mission, uh, about 22 orbits, really. And as he proceeded through the mission, he started losing more and more of the components. The batteries started to fail. These were battery powered. The systems were shutting down. Shutting down. Mm -hmm. And he finally had used his wristwatch as his time device, the same kind I had flown on my Mercury flight. It was very precise. It was uh, an Omega watch, and it was very, very accurate. And they used that watch for the rest of the flights after that. That's why, how good it was. But he did his retrofire with that watch and with his manual attitude and landed closer to the carrier than I did. So I'm still jealous of Is him. Is that right? He did, he did a good job. <laughs> well, he was my backup. And then it turned out at that point in time, uh, Gordo's backup was Alan Shepard. So the cycle was going around again. I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, on your flight, uh, you discovered that Australia was off on the maps. Would you tell our viewers about that? Well, it was interesting. Cause I, every time I did a retrofire and a reentry. I was off like 3.9, 4.1, 3.9, 4, 4.1. I was always averaging four miles. I said, there's something wrong with this whole program. Let's go back in time and find out where it all started. It turned out the mark I had, the last geographic mark, was Australia. I said, I landed in the Pacific. And that turned out to be four miles off. And I said, Australia's out of position. And it turned out it was. So all the maps in the world were wrong. <laughs> Slightly off, yeah. And, and uh, you corrected, uh, the, I guess all the maps in the world were changed as a result well, that, of, of that your one, discovery. Of yeah, uh -huh. it's kind of fun. Okay. Uh, that concluded the Mercury project. Next up was the Gemini. Yep. And uh, you flew again. Uh, with was it Tom Stafford Tom you Stafford flew with it? Yeah. Would you tell our viewers about that? Because uh, I think it, it took you three times to get up there. We, we use the expression three times as a charm, but the, uh, the initial mission was to uh, launch our Gemini 6 into orbit and rendezvous and dock with a, a vehicle called the Gina, which would be launched on a, a different booster, on a Titan. And it would uh, go into orbit, and we would then rendezvous, take off and chase it, essentially, and rendezvous with it. It didn't make it into orbit. So that was, that was the end of that mission. So then a couple of engineers from McDonnell Douglas, uh, John Yardley and Walter Burke, in fact, I re never forget the names because they saved us, said, why don't you have the Gemini 6 guys, Sharon Stafford, rendezvous with Borman and Lovell, who will be up there for a two-week mission. So we recycled after they took off, recycled the launch pad, and we got ready to launch. And we went through the full countdown, and bang, T0, liftoff, the clock has started. The mission control said that. I didn't say that. In milliseconds, this is really a short period of time, I realized we had not lifted off. That we were not you you had counted down, yeah. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, the, 0. The clock in the spacecraft started counting. Mm -hmm. Mission control, launch control, all said liftoff. And I said, no, nope, not liftoff. But you were just sitting there. We sat there. In the, the choice was if it lifted off and then settled down, it would be a monster explosion and it would kill us. Our backup plan was to use ejection seats, two of us, and we'd eject out. And Which out. was about 50% safe. Oh, we, we, we think it was a little bit better than yeah. that. But it was, it was equally dangerous. It was still to, dangerous. Was dangerous. E well, just sure. to eject sure. was dangerous. Well, at that right. point in time, we had aircraft, much as you see around the museum now, that have ejection seats. But we had ejection seats that were usable at sea level, so you could eject even on the runway. Now, that doesn't mean you guarantee you're going to live through it. But I had known from having had a previous flight on the Atlas with Mercury that we had not lifted off. So my decision was correct. We did not eject. Now, you made what is called a command decision. Yeah, that was that, exactly. Uh, you weren't sitting on the back row of the balcony. You no. were down in the arena, uh, and you had to make the command decision. No choice. You're right. So uh, you did go into space. We launched, of course, on the third time. Everything worked beautifully. We had a, a close round of as close as you and I are together. Uh, I think your remark was probably the best, blue angels in space. Yes, you, you, were, you were blue angels in orbit yeah. because you were flying, uh, what, 18, 24 inches apart, yeah, something easily. like that. What was interesting, uh, as pilots, NASA doesn't understand all that because most of them were too They're not pilots, right. 
And we are accustomed to flying formation like this around and turning and all that. And these people have never done that. And they said, well, you can't do it at night. I said, well, if I have two points of light, I can do it at night. We stayed in formation for, oh, about five or six hours. There's no problem at all. Uh, the NASA people were good at what they do. Oh, sure. Uh, but they weren't pilots. Well, it's a, it's a case of judging when to change the system and let, let the commanding officer of the ship or the aircraft make the final decision if, if, if safety is involved. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the mission goes, the mission should be controlled by the ground. But as far as the, ad, the actual spacecraft and the activities within it, that's controlled by the commander. On the board. commander. Yeah. Uh, so you broke out of the uh, orbit then and came down and landed, and uh, the other ship stayed in orbit for a, another, what, week no, or something? Another couple of days. Another we, couple of days? I think we rendezvoused on the 11th day, and then they, we left them on the 12th day, or the 13th day, really. And when I got down, we landed quite close to the carrier again. And then I got on the horn, meaning I could speak to Frank and Orbit. I said, oh, there are a couple of things I should tell you about reentry. I told him too much, and he got closer to the carrier also. <laughs> so we still kid about that. Then uh, after you left uh, the uh, space program, uh, what did you do? Well, I, actually, I had an Apollo flight after that. Oh, you had another one after yeah, that? Apollo 7. Tell us about that. Yeah, see, Apollo 7. Now, the Mercury was first, then yeah, Gemini, and then, then, then Apollo. Apollo. Yeah. Tell us about the Apollo flight. Well, I uh, initially uh, had my own assigned flight with uh, Walt Cunningham and Don Isley for the second flight, the same damn technique we did with Shepard Grissom, Glenn Carpenter. I was going to do a mirror image of Grissom's flight with a, uh, an orbital flight. And I kept saying, hey, this is a dumb thing. We've already done that kind of stuff. If, he, if this flight goes well, let me go on and do something better. Something new and different. That's it. So I wanted mm -hmm. the newer phase of the Apollo spacecraft. Well, Grissom and his crew were lost on the launch pad. They had the fire. And Grissom. I remember Ed White and, Ed White and Gus Grissom, Roger, they burned. Roger Chaffee. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, the result of that was, of course, that then I was moved up to the number one flight in a later version of the Apollo spacecraft. And we were... Now, the Apollo is the one that went to the moon? That was the idea. Uh, the, the command module is the vehicle within which the three astronauts fly to the moon and back. Then they separate from the command service module, the lunar module, which they fly docked together mm -hmm. all the way to the moon. Then the lunar module lands on the moon, two go down to the moon, come back up again, rendezvous with the command module, and come back to Earth. Well, the whole whole program of that flight could run as much as 10 or 11 days. Now, so, who was your crew on, on your... Uh, uh, this was Don Isley and Walt Cunningham. The three of you. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we orbited Earth in the command module and service module for 11 days to prove it would last. That it could be done. To do mm -hmm. the trip to the moon and back. Mm -hmm. And we exercised all of the functions, including getting an Emmy for our first television flight from space. <laughs> Have you had your Emmy yet, Frank? No, not yet. <laughs> We actually did have an Emmy for the Well, you're, you're, you're up on me. You're, you're one up on me. Uh, that, that, you, uh, we, did, we did that. that you transmitted the first television images television. from space? Yeah. Well, that's worthy of an Emmy. Sure. Sure. <laughs> I got a second one doing Apollo 11 with Walter, Cron with, uh, Walter Cronkite. Wow. <laughs> yes, I'm a two Emmy man. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, that's, I have to fill you in. You're talking to the spaceman now. See? That's right. Uh, Eleven days, you said you were. Eleven days. Eleven you days. Know, enough, that becomes very boring. I had a, you know those little bands you put around your wristwatch band with a calendar on. Yes. It was October. Uh -huh. I remember when those first came yeah. out. I kept scratching days off it, uh, just like a prisoner. Because uh, you do your task. Uh, we had uh, changes of orbit. Uh, docking, uh, uh, coming back to the Saturn booster to look at it, uh, did some photographic experiments, changed the orbit, did a lot of maneuvers. And after each maneuver, you had hours and hours and hours to do something else in 11 days. Well, I'll, I'll share with our viewers the definition of flying. Uh -huh. It's uh, long periods of tedious boredom punctuated by moments of sharp stark terror. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so uh, you, were in, you were in that, but it was a magnified situation yes. because uh, you wouldn't have a, a near miss or something. Anything that happens in space is total disaster. It your whole day. Yeah. Yes, it would. <laughs> uh, so the Apollo that you, what was the, the number that you flew? Apollo 7. Apollo 7. No, that was just a sequential number, not like Mercury 7. In fact, my Gemini was Gemini 6. My Mercury, by definition, was really Mercury 8, but I call it Sigma 7. But, but what you did 
uh, was the equivalent to flying to the moon oh, yes. because you were proving that it could be done. Exactly. We were hibernating for 11 days. We had to work on it. Mm -hmm. And you think well, recently uh, an American woman was up there for, what, six months? Yes, that's true. <laughs> she can take my turn at that. That's a long time. <laughs> Walter Wally Chira is descended from French Huguenots who immigrated to Switzerland. His father was a pilot in World War I and later a stunt pilot during the old barnstorming days. His mother was a wing walker, so Wally comes by aviation naturally. Wally grew up in Oradale, New Jersey. He played hockey, soccer, and basketball. He took trumpet lessons, worked as a caddy, and built his own kayak. Wally hung around the airport at Teterboro, New Jersey. He received his first flying lesson at age 13 from his father, and he soloed at age 16. At Dwight Morrow High School in Inglewood, New Jersey, Wally was voted best artist by his classmates and excelled in mathematics. After graduation from high school, he entered Newark College of Engineering. He studied aeronautical engineering and was a member of Sigma Chi fraternity. Wally's father wanted him to go to West Point because he had been in the Army. But Wally chose to go to Annapolis. Because of World War II, the four-year curriculum was accelerated to three years, and Wally graduated in June of 1945 in the top third of his class with a Bachelor of Science degree and an ensign's commission. He was assigned to the cruiser Alaska, but on his way to the war, it ended. Wally served with the Seventh Fleet in the Pacific. He completed aviators training school in Pensacola, Florida, and flew 90 combat missions in Korea as an exchange pilot with the Air Force. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and two Air Medals. Wally served as a test pilot at China Lake, California, where he participated in the development of the Sidewinder missile. He had over 3,800 hours of flying time when he was chosen to be one of America's seven original astronauts. And now for part two of Wally Shira, Mercury astronaut, Gemini astronaut, and Apollo astronaut. Uh, tell us about your flight in the Mercury program. Well, I named the spacecraft, here I go, spacecraft again. I named the spacecraft Sigma 7, and the symbol Sigma would be like a wide open E. Mm -hmm. but a Greek E. A Greek E, exactly. Mm -hmm. But it stands for, the symbol Sigma stands for the sum of the engineering effort of all these people to make the flight go the way it should go, perfectly. And I named it Sigma 7. Now, the 7 comes from the 7 of us. We named all of our spacecraft something, 7, Freedom, Faith, mm -hmm. Aurora, Sigma 7. And that's why we, uh, we honored each other, because we all worked together so closely. The flight, I wanted to work perfectly. I wanted to save attitude control fuel. When the spacecraft, pilots have to use their hands. Mm -hmm. Spacecraft rolls or pitches or yaws, but a controller would do it this way. And you'd go, Psh! and it would go like that. And then you'd go, Psh! to stop it, because you just keep on going around. So each time you did that, you, you used up attitude control fuel. They could do, Psh! 
which would waste a lot too of fuel. Much. Too mm -hmm. much. And that's what happened to Glenn and Carpenter. They used too much fuel. So I made very tiny motions, and as a result, I had 80% of my attitude control fuel by the time I ended the mission. Well, I want to say to our viewers that um, you flew an absolutely perfect, no mistakes, no errors, textbook flight and came down in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> True. <laughs> so uh, you, you didn't run out of fuel or uh, make any mistakes. You flew an absolutely perfect mission. Uh, but when you came down, the front page was full of the Cuban Missile yes. Crisis. You know, oddly enough, uh, we went to Washington to President Kennedy's Oval Office. Sitting in there with my wife, my son, and my daughter. My daughter was five. She held her little hand up like I'm five to then President Kennedy rocking in his chair. That very day, he was wondering whether the missile crisis would come to an end or not. That very day. So I'm in the history books at least for being with the president on that day. Next up was the Gemini. Yep. And uh, you flew again. Uh, with was it Tom Stafford Tom you flew Stafford with it? Yeah. Would you tell our viewers about that? Because uh, I think it, it took you three times to get up there. We, we use the expression three times as a charm, but the, uh, the initial mission was to uh, launch our Gemini 6 into orbit and rendezvous and dock with a, a vehicle called the Gina, which would be launched on a, a different booster, on a Titan. And it would uh, go into orbit, and we would then rendezvous, take off, and chase it essentially, and rendezvous with it. It didn't make it into orbit, so that was that was the end of that mission. So then, a couple of engineers from McDonnell Douglas, uh, John Yardley and Walter Burke, in fact, I re never forget the names because they saved us. Said, "Why don't you have the Gemini Six guys, Sharon Stafford, rendezvous with Borman and Lovell, who'll be up there for a two-week mission?" So we recycled after they took off, recycled the launch pad, and we got ready to launch. And we went through the full countdown, and bang, T-0, liftoff, the clock has started. The mission control said that. I didn't say that. In milliseconds, this is really a short period of time, I realized we had not lifted off, that we were not sending... You, you had counted down, yeah. five, four, well, three, two, one, the, zero. The clock in the spacecraft started counting. Mm -hmm. Mission control, launch control, all said liftoff. And I said, nope, not liftoff. But you were just sitting there. We sat there in the... The choice was if it lifted off and then settled down, it'd be a monster explosion and it would kill us. Our backup plan was to use ejection seats, two of us, and we'd eject out. And Which out. was about 50% safe. Oh, we, we, we think it was a little better than yeah. that. But it was, it was equally... It was still it was dangerous. dangerous. Well, sure. Just to eject sure. was dangerous. Well, at that right. point in time, we had aircraft, much as you see around the museum now, that have ejection seats. But we had ejection seats that were usable at sea level, so you could eject even on the runway. Now, that doesn't mean you guarantee you're going to live through it. But I had known from having had a previous flight on the Atlas with Mercury that we had not lifted off. So my decision was correct. We did not eject. Now, you made what is called a command decision. Yeah, that was that, exactly. Uh, you weren't sitting on the back row of the balcony. You were no. down in the arena, uh, and you had to make the command decision. No choice. You're right. Wally, would you tell our viewers about your Apollo space flight? You were in all three programs, the Mercury, the Gemini, and the Apollo. Would you tell our viewers about the Apollo? Well, it really comes down to a very simple thing. Mercury was a one seat, Gemini was two seats, Apollo was three. And that's all we had. So I tried all three. But, but you really, were a triple threat man. You were in all three uh, programs. You know, oddly enough, I, I finally got the tag of being unique. No one else did that. Uh, no one has ever flown all three of those missions. Others have flown more than three missions, four, five, and six, counting the shuttle flights today. But the, the Apollo flight I flew was essentially to bring the Apollo program into being. It was the first flight of Apollo. We'd lost three men on the launch pad, Gus Grissom, uh, Roger White, and, uh, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. The result of that was, of course, we were set back for about a year. And with that, uh, my crew, Walt Cunningham and Don Osley and I, and Tom Stafford was my backup on this, Gene Cernan and John Young were my backup crew. And we six worked very, very hard. We had three others, uh, Ron Evans, uh, Jack Swigert, and Bill Pogue. So we had nine of us working on this mission to get it going. Uh, the other three I mentioned last were our support crew. So here were nine crew members assigned to that mission to make a success out of it. We had to fly it in space for 11 days, 
10.8 days to be more exact, to duplicate the time frame that would be involved with going to the moon and back. So what you actually did was the equivalent to if you had actually flown to the moon and back. Yes, that was the whole idea, to see mm -hmm. if the spacecraft would work, if the crew would work. And I was a fighter pilot. I like short missions. I don't like those long ones where you bore holes in the sky for a long time. Those are milk runs. Yes, exactly. I was a fighter pilot, not a bomber pilot. And uh, it's, we kid about it, but uh, there's a lot of boredom. I, I had that watch band on that I had for the month of October of 1968, and I kept scratching days off, much like a prisoner. So thinking, when is this thing going to be over? And a lot of my aerospace engineering friends said, I don't think sure I was going to last 11 days. There was no problem lasting, just pure boredom. And that, unfortunately, is what happens with a lot of these long duration flights. There's not much to do because you, you're given eight hours, a block of eight hours to sleep. You don't need that much sleep. You're not that physically tired. Your right. brain may be tired, but your mm -hmm. body's not tired. So we did this 10.8 day mission, exercised the engines, made the spacecraft do all the tricks it had to do, and proved it could go into orbit, into the way to the moon, and come back again with the time needed to take the crew to the moon and bring them back again. So we were pretty happy with it. After the Apollo mission, uh, did you stay in the space program? I announced before the mission I was leaving the program. I'd, I'd had those, knowing I'd had the third flight, I'd had enough. Each flight... Well, you had been there, done that. <laughs> Three years almost. Mm -hmm. Every flight took three years of training. We trained for every possible contingency, no surprises. And you and I talked about this one time, but we didn't want to be scared. We didn't want to have fear. We trained out surprises so we had apprehension. What, what I told him was, uh, I've made parachute jumps, and uh, I've had people say, were you scared the first time you jumped? And my answer is, I was scared the last time I jumped. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and uh, <laughs> courage is not uh, doing something when you're not afraid. Mm -hmm. Courage is when you're, you're afraid or you're scared or you're concerned and you grit your teeth and you go ahead and do it anyway. That's true. So uh, what you exhibited was the ultimate in courage because uh, the tiniest little anything and, and you would be pulverized. Well, ruin my day, I know that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, oddly enough, in contrast, though, a person in combat where the enemy's shooting at you and then they'd still go to the enemy, that is infinite courage. That's a hero. We, we were professionally trained. We were test pilots, military test pilots. We'd been through all the little hoops and loops that one could possibly do. So we knew where we were going. We also knew that we had the odds of living through it. But if your heat shield comes loose, yeah, takes, or if your system oh, yeah. shut down, or if you run out of fuel, uh, there's still a great deal of danger. That's true. So did you get out of the space program then? Well, I, I left the space program uh, July 1st of 1969. Oddly enough, I was in the middle of the Sinai Desert. This is near Israel, part of yes, the, uh -huh. the Egyptians and the... the Moses Jewish. crossed the Sinai, well, I, went, I went through the monastery at Santa Carina, Katerina, which is Mount Moses, exactly. And it was on this mountain on the top of this hill, above this monastery. My son and I watched the sun coming up as the moon set. That was my first day is that as a civilian right? in 1969. I had joined an oil and gas company in Denver, and after about a few months, I found out I was in the wrong company and left it. So I went on and formed my own company, an environmental engineering company, solving uh, environmental problems for various governments of the states. Uh, for Coors Beer, I convinced them to recycle aluminum cans, which, of course, is very common today. Yes, uh, this is but you were a pioneer in that. Doing that, so I had mm -hmm. another pioneering work effort. Uh, did some work on uh, what we call synthetic fuel. It was a synthetic natural gas. Kind of sounds funny, doesn't it? But if you make gas, which would be methane, CH4, mm -hmm. out of coal and water. We we're going to do this up in Wyoming. And it fell apart because it never has come down to the price of drilling for natural gas or for oil. So it's still there in the data bank that we could take all that coal that's underground up in the Wyoming area, Fort Union Basin, mountains and mountains of coal underneath the ground, but not far down to make energy. So that was an interesting part of it. I took that company into a California company, and then that company in turn was acquired by a Houston company. The whole loop kept going around and around, and uh, my environmental company was gone. Then I became a, an officer of Johns Manville, a building products company. Mm -hmm. and then later years- I Shingles is what I remember, yeah, Johns yeah, Mansfield yeah. roofing shingles. And insulation, mm -hmm. pipe, all mm -hmm. that. Uh, this, 
I left them after about three years and became independent. And I became a director of a bank, and I was a director of Kimberly Clark, the Kleenex tissue company. Mm -hmm. uh, left them just recently. Enjoyed that kind of role. So I, I got involved with a number of corporations as an outside director, and then I, I'm active now as an inside director with this museum. Uh, and how fortunate the museum is to have someone of uh, your stature well, on the board. I'm very proud of the museum. As you may know, in this area where we have Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo replicas, Ed McKellar, our director, calls it Wally World. Oh, Wally World? <laughs> uh -huh. And the reason for that is, of course, most of the things have my name on it. And uh, my other astronauts don't particularly like that name, Wally World, but we still call it Wally World. I'd like to take just a moment and salute Ed McKellar, Captain Ed McKellar. Yes. Uh, who's the director of the museum. Uh, the museum that people visit today uh, started over from zero, from scratch, after the tragic fire. And what he and, and the employees and the volunteers and the docents have done here uh, is really they've built it from the ground up from zero since the tragic fire. You know, it's interesting. When I came on this board, I didn't know what docent was, for example. Mm -hmm. And docent is a person who does everything and anything without any sense of remuneration. Not one cent is paid. They're restored. And Everything total happens. commitment. Total commitment. Isn't that wild how, mm -hmm. what neat people there are? We have people in the basement of this museum restoring that, that Ford Trimotor just breaks my heart yes. to see it. And these guys who have retired from aerospace companies bring their equipment with them. Old lathes, old saws, metal saws, and old equipment, and make old aircraft new again. It's really, really a very exciting place to be. We're very fortunate. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your uh, family history. Mm. Uh, your background in aviation goes back to before you were born. <laughs> That's true. Uh, I've heard rumors that your mother was a wing walker. Yeah. Well, Dad convinced Mother they were barnstorming in New Jersey with a Curtis Jenny, a JN4. There's one, there's a Jenny in, in the museum. And it convinced Mother to climb out in the wing. The passenger was in the forward <laughs> cockpit. And look at the Your rocker. father yeah. convinced your mother <laughs> to climb out on the wing. Yeah. Yeah. And this was to check the rockers. And then, of course, that was a stunt. And then they would attract people watching this idiot up there in this wing and this guy flying around to come and fly with them for $5 a ride. Mother would get out then and let someone else in the passenger seat. Mother said she stopped being a wing walker when I was in the hangar. That's pretty good aviation talk. <laughs> so your father was the pilot of a Jenny and your mother was a wing walker. Well, Dad flew in World War I with the uh, RAF. Oh, he combat. did? Oh, he in the in. RAF? Yeah. And then he came back to the what was then called the U.S. Signal Corps. So he was a hot shot. Yes, uh, the uh, airplanes were originally in the Signal Corps yeah. and then part of the Army Air Corps mm -hmm. before they became yeah. Air, Force. Air Force. So with that background, uh, you didn't go to uh, uh, the Air Force Academy. Well, I guess they didn't have the Air they didn't Force have Academy. It. Dad wanted me to go to West Point. That's right, because uh, the Air Force Academy was 1954 55. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, he wanted you to go to West Point, That's it. and instead... I went to the Naval Academy. <laughs> I got wings of gold instead of wings of silver. And uh, when did... Wings of gold, a little tiny one there. Navy yeah. Wings of Gold, that was a movie. Yes, it was. Uh, I don't remember who was in it, but I remember Navy Wings... Robert Young, I think. That sounds right. Yeah. Wendy Berry, Navy Wings of Gold. Oh, good memory. Uh, the, uh, the sequel to it was Wings Over Honolulu. <laughs> well, we have a second home in Hawaii, so that fits. <laughs> and you, you mentioned earlier, too, I think, that uh, you, were, you had a condo at Steamboat Springs. Yeah, Are you familiar back. with Colorado? Well, when I had the environmental company, uh, one of our projects was to develop uh, a ski resort north of Steamboat Springs, a totally different area. The, the ski resort most people call Steamboat Springs was then Mount Werner. And I arranged for Mount Werner and the city of Steamboat Springs to integrate, to join each other, to make life easier to run the mountain as well as the city, because they have two different seasons. Then I, with the condo, I had my team up at Steamboat. They used the condo as well. Uh, we did some surveys on land north of Steamboat Springs, a little town of Clark near Steamboat Lake. And they were going to put a, a village of homes in there and a ski resort. There are probably about 20 homes in there now. But so I know that area quite well. Is there anything you'd like to tell our viewers in closing? We're very honored to have someone of your stature with yeah. us today. Well, one of the things I can say is you, you really should come to our museum. Uh, we're all very thrilled with it. Uh, we've outgrown the area. We have a second facility at Gillespie Field. Yes, a restoration hangar at Gillespie Airport in El Cajon. 
And there we have an atlas, by the way, the last atlas that was at General Dynamics. The employees willed that atlas when they shut down that facility to our Air and Space Museum. So that is out there. Uh, on display. The, uh, the mayor of El Cajon wrote a letter to the governor mm -hmm. and said that when, they, when the city makes a request to Sacramento mm -hmm. that they should listen because El Cajon is the only city that has their only, that has, has an intercontinental ballistic missile. Ah, very good. I didn't know that one. That's good. Uh, so they have the restoration hangar there at Gillespie Airport and uh, in addition to the museum here. Mm -hmm. uh, what else would you like to tell our viewers? If you can, try to big, big deal your way into the basement and look at the work that those docents do putting the aircraft together. That, that, that thrills me more than anything. Now they have an Eindecker down there, too, yeah, that they're that. working yeah. on. An Eindecker was the first German airplane in World War I. Thank you very much for being with us today. We've uh, enjoyed the visit. Captain Fred, a pleasure for me. Thank you for your work with aviation, for your contribution to space, and especially here in San Diego for your work for the Aerospace Museum. Thank you, sir. As always, this is Captain Fred saying, I love airplanes and I honor the people who fly them. Thank <laughs> you.